The Tyranids in Warhammer 40,000 are a relatively new threat to the Imperium, arriving in three great waves of invaders in the latter years of M41. The first of the Tyrannic Wars against the direct assault of the Hive Fleet known as Behemoth had been repulsed by the Ultramarines, but the second incursion of the Tyranids would prove much more difficult to contain. So the first encounter the Warhammer 40,000 Galaxy had with the bio fleets of the hive mind took the form of Hive Fleet Behemoth, a brutally direct horde bludgeoning their way through the eastern fringe, terrorizing the star systems of the Ultima Segmentum, and leaving only barren rocks in its wake. After a scramble by Imperial authorities to ascertain the intentions of this new alien species, the Hive Fleet was finally, barely, defeated at the Battle of McCrag in 766 M41, where the combined forces of Ultramar and Battlefleet Tempestus managed to hold back the tide and splinter Behemoth's headlong charge. But the second Tyranid invasion would take a much more subtle and diffuse route into the Imperium and would be all the more difficult to hold back. Since the defeat of Hive Fleet Behemoth, the Tyranids have become something of an ever-present threat to our galaxy, especially on the Eastern Fringe. Splinter fleets of Behemoth continued to plague the void between stars for hundreds of years, descending on isolated worlds to consume all the biomass they needed to keep going. But these grew smaller and smaller, other new Hive fleets that emerged, some tracked by the Imperium, but they mostly seemed drawn to Xenos races. In the early 800s, 40 years after after the defeat of Behemoth, Hive Fleet Naga attacked the region of Imperial space known as the Olmiathic League, destroying the planets of Cinderfall and Silax, which fell to a huge gene stealer infestation. But the majority of the Hive Fleet directed itself against Eldari craft worlds in the area, fighting running battles with the fleets of Iandan, Malantai, and Idari, before eventually consuming the Exodite world of Halathel and Craftworld Malantai itself. And a hundred years later than that, in 901 M41, the extremely adaptable Hive Fleet Gorgon made inroads against the Tau Empire, assaulting first the forested planet of Shadraig, where they fought a guerrilla war against Kroot kindreds on the surface, and then assaulting the set world of Kelshan. Gorgon was beaten back by a combination of Tau, Imperial, and Necron forces, though not before it had collected the genetic material of the Tau defenders. With this ongoing series of conflicts bubbling across Xenos space, the Imperium might be forgiven for assuming that the greater threat was over. And so when the second great Hive Fleet started its invasion of Imperial space, the assumption was that this was down to just more splinters of Behemoth or smaller fleets. After all, the Imperium had bigger matters to deal with because the planet of Icar IV was in open rebellion. The Icar system was a linchpin of the Ultima Segmentum, a factory world whose manufactorums and refineries processed the ore and mycoproteins that fed and supplied hundreds of worlds. So when a wave of rebellions erupted across the Ultima Segmentum, the Inquisition were quick to act, interrogating thousands for signs of organized recidivism, even as far away as on Terra, where members of the Adeptus with even a passing connection to the Eastern Fringe were rounded up and incinerated. But no clear link could be found. When Icar joined the ranks of the rebellious systems, the Inquisition Fortress at Talassa Prime dispatched a delegation under Inquisitor Agmar, and what they found when they arrived in orbit was worrying. Years before, a religious fundamentalist group calling itself the Brotherhood had risen on Icar IV, starting out as a sect of charity who preached the imminent return of the Emperor as a saviour to the downtrodden factory workers. But in the early 990s M41, after the Brotherhood were granted permission to build their own cathedral, trouble started. The organization refused to pay its tithes and started whipping up its followers into great purges across the planet. When they were contained by the local arbitrators, riots broke out and the Arbites, grossly outnumbered, were forced to fall back and call for PDF support. But the PDF were thoroughly infiltrated by this new cult. And over the next few hours, the planetary governor and much of the senior government had been assassinated by the rebels and PDF tanks daubed with rebel slogans had appeared in every city across the planet. The Inquisition delegation arrived seven days after the outbreak, but to Agmar's eyes, this wasn't just some random upsurge of popular opinion that the Brotherhood liked to portray. It had the feel of an organized plot. 
With Imperial Guard and Arbati's forces embattled on the surface, he sent a call for aid to the Ultramarines chapter of Space Marines. Six days later, the final Arbati's garrison fell to the rebellion, detonating the main power generators of the capital, and the war reached something of a stalemate, but by this time Agmar had led several small task forces into the cities and seen the Brotherhood firsthand, and this evidence, along with readings from the Imperial Tarot, confirmed his suspicion. The Brotherhood were a gene stealer cult. The Imperium had been aware of the threat of gene stealers for many centuries, way longer than they'd been aware of the Tyranids. They'd first discovered gene stealers on the moons of Yumgal, and originally thought they were indigenous to that system, spreading through the galaxy by sneaking into the holds of transport ships. It was only in the aftermath of Behemoth, when gene stealers were used as shock troops by the Hive Fleet, that their connection to the Tyranids had emerged. In the wake of that first war, the Salamanders chapter of Space Marines had thoroughly purged the moons of Yumgal, and the Inquisition had increased its vigilance for gene stealer activity, but the full nature of that link was still barely understood. Nevertheless, when two companies of Ultramarines arrived at Icar aboard the battle barge Octavius, they acted swiftly. The Space Marines deployed via drop pod assault into the heart of the capital, decapitating the Militia HQ in the former Governor's Palace, and disrupting the Brotherhood forces so much that the Imperial Guard, camped out in the countryside, were finally able to push back into the cities. From orbit, Agmar kept a close watch until he saw the telltale signs of high-ranking Brotherhood members converging on their cathedral, and he gave the signal for elements of the first company to intercept them. In the naves of the cathedral, the Brotherhood finally threw aside their robes and revealed themselves, and the Space Marine Terminators pursued them into the warren of tunnels below the cathedral. Here was the true center of the cult, and in the crypts below the surface, the Terminators fought a desperate battle against hordes of pure strain gene stealers. Their accompanying librarian finally locating the Patriarch at the center of the cult and killing it. Over the coming weeks and months, all signs of the cult were rooted out by inquisitorial forces and by the Ultramarines, but one thing preyed on their mind. At the moment of the Patriarch's death, the Librarian and the Inquisitor's astropaths had detected a psychic scream and a distant shift in the warp, like the movement of a great shadow. And when Agmar reported back to the Inquisition, he was warned that refugees were arriving from the East, as whole systems had fallen silent. The survivors told tales of skies turned black by leathery wings, of whole continents overrun by hordes of Xenos, devouring everything in their path. The invasion of High Fleet Kraken had begun. Nobody knew how many worlds had already fallen. Instead of the headlong mass of Behemoth, Kraken came on as a series of smaller fleets, all acting in concert. The Diatan, Salem, and Viridian sectors, far to the northeast, were the first to fall silent, but soon more central worlds, like Tereska and Devlin, came under attack. The muddy world of Devlin was overrun by Tyranids, led by a huge synapse creature known as the Red Terror. Its remaining population only saved due to a suicidal assault by a company of Lamenters space marines as their whole chapter on Penitent Crusade for their part in the Bad Ab Wars threw themselves into the teeth of Kraken to try and blunt its advance. They weren't the only Space Marine chapter brought to the edge of extinction. The Knights of Eternity chapter was destroyed, and on the northern fringes of Ultramar, the world of Sotha was overrun by a tendril of Kraken, and its defenders, the Scythes of the Emperor, were almost wiped out. The survivors relocated to the Miral system, where they were then pushed back again after the Tyranids assaulted the great Meza known as the Giant's Coffin, where the Scythes had intended to make their last stand. The tendrils of Kraken continued to push into the galaxy, assaulting a slew of different worlds, opening fronts across the reach of space, far, far too many for the defenders to effectively contain, but eventually the tendrils started to converge on two locations. The first of those was the Eldar craft world of Iandan. Iandan hung in the void between the stars to the galactic east, one of the oldest and most famous of the Eldar craft worlds. Though its farseers had been reporting echoes of the Great Devourer since the defeat of High Fleet Naga, it was the rangers of Iandan who first brought word of the tendrils heading their way. Iandan had never been the most populous of the fragile Eldari diaspora, and so, with a heavy heart, its leader, the farseer Kelmon, took the decision to wake the ghost warriors. In an act seen by many 
many Eldari as akin to grave robbing, the souls of dead Eldar were implanted in wraithbone constructs to fight alongside the living defenders. After 20 days of preparation, the vast shoal of Tyranid bioships hove into view and started to throw themselves at the craft world in unrelenting waves. When two waves of ships hit at once, the fleet of Eandum was finally pushed aside and spores rained down into the wraithbone towers and gardens of the Eldar. The guardians and aspect warriors of Eandon fighting a losing battle in defense of their homes, even the waking of the Avatar couldn't hold back the Tyranid attack. It was only when the Corsair Prince Uriel, exiled from Iandon years before, finally returned at the head of his fleet, the Eldritch Raiders, and destroyed the largest of the bioships in orbit, that the tide started to turn. Taking up the cursed Spear of Twilight from the vaults of the craft world, he defeated the Hive Tyrant leading the attack, and with their organization dissolving, the Tyranids were finally driven back. Iandum was victorious, but the cost was high. Four-fifths of the population were dead, and the craft world would rely on its ghost warriors for defense for centuries to come. But while the Inquisitor Chevak reported all of this back to the authorities of the Imperium, Iandum wasn't the only place the tendrils had converged. In 993 M41, various tendrils of Kraken combined for an assault on Icar 4, where the Patriarch's death scream had originated. But this time round, with time to prepare, the Imperium were able to mount a solid defense with the entire Ultramarines chapter in attendance, once again led by their chapter master, Marnius Kalgar. As the Hive Fleet came on and the shadow in the warp overtook the world, cults rose once again on the surface of the planet, as hidden remnants of the Brotherhood burst from the sewers, overrunning many of the defense lines and giving the lie to the idea that the planet had been cleansed. Various tendrils managed to run the Imperial blockade, raining down even more advanced bioforms on the planet, including great bio-titans. The tendrils of Kraken were finally throwing everything into one coordinated push. But the Ultramarines were in a much better position, having been developing their strategies and analyzing their enemy for centuries, and still counting amongst their number many veterans of the previous war. Their armada inflicted crushing losses on the Hive fleet in space, and Kalgar rallied the defenders on the surface, and even fought a second duel against the bioform known as the Swarmlord, finally slaying the beast. Without central command on the surface, and with the Hive fleet contained by the Ultramarines fleet, Kraken was defeated. With the twin losses at Yandan and Icar, the concentrated force of Kraken was split again, but the Hive Fleet had always been a diffuse and many-headed beast, and so, just like before, splinter fleets and tendrils of Kraken continued to plague the galaxy for years afterwards. One particularly large splinter fleet, named Megalodon, used lictors and gene stealers to infiltrate the crystal mining worlds around Heardos 12, and a second splinter fleet assaulted the Tau Sep world of Dalith, its air casts spending their void assets to slow the Tyranids and give the Sep world time to prepare its defenses. The spread of cults and uprisings proved to be one of the more insidious results of the breaking of Kraken. Chaplain Cassius and his Tyrannic War veterans led missions to Gosar Quintus, only to discover that the ruling dynasty of that world and its neighboring sectors had been thoroughly infiltrated, and across the Ultima Segmentum, riots and uprisings broke out in what became known as the Season of Unrest. Kraken was a very different beast to Behemoth, and its various tendrils and splinters meant that the Imperium could never again assume the Tyranid threat had been defeated. The constant war against infiltrating Tyranid fleets would continue for the rest of that decade, but the next major incursion was following hot on the heels of Kraken, and only five years later, the Imperium would be plunged into its third Tyrannic War against the Hive fleet it named Leviathan which is the next video. Thanks for watching. And if you'd like to hear more about the events of Warhammer 40k, then click on the little link to the right there. You can also join the Patreon or the Discord for early access to videos and the ability to vote on the videos. If you want to buy me a gribbly hoard of my own, there's some links to affiliate stores in the thing below. See ya.